Women once marched for the freedom to smoke cigarettes. The internet says it's true. Hey, welcome to The Internet Says It's True, where every week we learn something that sounds like I just made it up, but it's really true. And this is part of the WCBE podcast experience. My name is Michael Kent. This is episode 150, 150 episodes. Can you believe we've done 150 weeks of this? Uh, This week we bring you another news story that is as bizarre as it is timely, even though it took place in 1929. Uh, Stay tuned for later in the show. We'll be talking with comedian Lisa Berry. So now we're back in the full flow of both producing these episodes and touring with my show again. By the way, tickets are still available for Columbus, Ohio this weekend, July 20 and 21. If you want to come see me perform my comedy at Magic Show Live, uh, those two shows are at the Upfront Performance Space this weekend, actually Thursday and Friday. That's July 20 and 21. That's with Eric Dittleman, a mind reader who you probably know from listening to this podcast. Those tickets are available now at UpfrontPS.org. That's UpfrontPS.org. Buy some tickets. Come see me if you're in the uh, the Ohio area. Also, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the folks on Patreon. Thank you so much for supporting me. I appreciate you greatly. You can join the Patreon at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. And when you do that, you get access to stuff the rest of the world doesn't get to see. Like, you know, the videos from every week, 65 episodes of my web show, Joke Story Trick, stickers in the mail, and more. Again, join up today. That's patreon.com slash Michael Kent. So let's get into this week's story. I also want to mention that in the story, we will be using gender binary language because that's how things were defined during the time it took place. We're talking about cigarette smokers. It wasn't until the late 1960s that America started running anti-smoking campaigns on television. They were aired as part of the Fairness Doctrine. For every cigarette ad, the FCC required that television stations also run one anti-smoking ad. And these were usually made with the support of the American Heart or Lung Associations. Ed Smith, home after another day of stress. So his wife serves him foods like cream soup, juicy roast beef, gravy, and desserts. Then she lights his cigarette and he's all set. Set with a lifestyle that could lead to a heart attack. Ask your heart association how to reduce your risk of heart attack. It's one of the services you support when you give to the Heart Fund. Until then, smoking was such a part of the American culture that almost half of all American adults smoked cigarettes. And of American smokers, only about 30% of those were women. This huge gender disparity in tobacco use continued until around the mid-90s, when that gap became much smaller. Most cigarette ads were geared toward men, but occasionally, tobacco brands would try to appeal to both men and women. Here's a cigarette commercial from the early 1960s. Want to give up strong-tasting cigarettes? Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Want to give up harsh-tasting cigarettes? Treat your taste kindly with Kent. Want to give up rough-tasting cigarettes? Treat your taste kindly with Kent Smoke Kent, the Micronite Filter Cigarette. Yes, Kent lets you get away from cigarettes that sometimes taste too strong, too harsh, too rough. Because Kent, with the new Micronite Filter, refines away harsh flavor, refines away rough taste for the mildest taste of all. If you want to get away from strong, harsh-tasting cigarettes, now's the time to change to Kent, the cigarette that made the filter famous. Remember, the finer the filter, the milder the taste. Treat your taste kindly with Kent Smoke Kent, the Micronite Filter Cigarette. But our story begins long before the 1960s and has to do with the reason for that huge disparity between men and women smokers. As far back as I could find, it was taboo for women in Western society to smoke. There were a few exceptions to this. For example, I found newspaper articles from 1880 describing to Americans how Italian women smoked. It was used to describe how different life was in Italy. Likewise, smoking was one of the things that was pointed to when an article was written talking about how barbaric and unrefined Native Americans in New Mexico were. Remember, these are newspaper articles from a long time ago. This is an 1880 newspaper describing the Navajo. Quote, The women smoke cigarettes, making them as they use them. 
the morals are as bad as well can be. A majority of their priests lived in open prostitution, end quote. It goes on like this, but it's interesting to see how tobacco use was linked to morality here, or the lack of morality. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, smoking among females was seen as a sign of loose morals, and it was often included in the same thought as prostitution and promiscuity. There are examples in 19th century art that depict females smoking cigarettes, and in many instances, it's used to convey a sense of rebellion, promiscuity, and personal empowerment. But there are also examples of art, like in Dutch paintings, where a female holding a cigarette is meant to be a sign of foolishness. There are newspaper articles citing Americans traveling to Europe and being completely aghast at women smoking openly in public. Meanwhile, back in America, there were places where women could be actually arrested for smoking in public. I found this newspaper entry, also from 1880, quote, in Providence, Rhode Island, two girls were recently arrested for smoking in the streets, while young men can strut forth with cigarette or full cigar and pass along like locomotives emitting a cloud of smoke and can do so with impunity. This is rank injustice. It is quite as proper for a young miss as it is for a young master to be caught tugging away at a cigar, and if the law is to assert its majesty in one case, it should in the other. No boy should be allowed the use of tobacco before he attains his majority any more than a girl of a like age, end quote. So that was a rather progressive sentiment for the time. Lots of cities were passing anti-smoking laws that just applied to women. In 1904, a woman named Janie Lasher was thrown in jail for smoking around her children. She was kept for 30 days in a Philadelphia jail. At that time, it was illegal for women to smoke in the presence of their family. In 1908, New York City voted to ban women from smoking in public. There were literally orders given to New York City police to arrest any proprietor or manager of a hotel, bar, cabaret, or other public establishment that allowed women to smoke. Of course, men could smoke wherever and whenever they wanted. By 1929, there was enough pushback on these uneven laws that women finally started to gather and march. So in the Easter parade of March 31st of that year, a group of women marched together under the name Torches of Freedom in New York City. Women weren't just fighting for smoking, they were fighting against the unfair and uneven application of the law. They saw smoking cigarettes as a form of freedom, and these smoking bans that only applied to women were limiting that freedom, so they marched with cigarettes in hand, carrying banners promoting gender equality and the right for them to smoke where and when they wanted to. It wasn't just New York City. Similar Torches of Freedom marches happened in Boston, Detroit, San Francisco, and various cities around the country. The marches caught the eyes of much of the national press and showed up in newspapers nationwide. The movement was being taken seriously, and the public took note. It sounds strange to give you this next statistic as a positive, but in 1923, only 5% of the cigarettes sold in the U.S. were smoked by women. After Torches of Freedom, that number shot up to 12% then to 18% in the next 10 years, and it just kept rising until the 1970s. The legislative efforts to ban women from smoking in different cities or states had failed. So the Torches of Freedom campaign was a success from the standpoint of opposing anti-smoking laws for women. But here's the question. Was it really a grassroots movement? The answer is no. And we'll find out who was behind the whole thing after a word from some of our sponsors. If you love listening to this podcast every week and you want to show your support, that would mean a great deal to me. You can do that by becoming a Patreon member. We've got members at all levels, whether you want to pledge $1 a month or $10 a month. Just think about the value that you receive from this show. And if you like the histories and the stories that you learn about or the jokes that you hear, and if you think that they're worth it, consider signing up. For that, you get every episode ad-free and a week early, access to bonuses like the unedited videos of the guest appearances, and 20% off all merchandise. You can sign up today at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. That's patreon.com slash Michael Kent. There was a time that humans used 100% organic products as healing balms and moisturizers for their skin. Well, I've partnered with an awesome company that wants to get back to those times. Fatco sells organic and responsibly made tallow-based skincare products. For centuries, humans used tallow in skin moisturizers and healing bombs, but 
Unfortunately, the topical application of these fats seemed to stop around the same time that animal fats stopped being considered part of a healthy diet. A lot of modern skincare products do more harm than good by stripping your skin of its natural oils. Let's change that. You can try them out now at fatco.com and get 15% off your order by using my promo code INTERNET. Go to the internet says it's true.com slash deals for the link. Let's talk about a guy named Edward Bernays. In his 1923 book, Crystallizing Public Opinion, he writes, quote, The only difference between propaganda and education really is in the point of view. The advocacy of what we believe in is education. The advocacy of what we don't believe in is propaganda. Each of these nouns carries with it social and moral implications. Education is valuable, commendable, enlightening, instructive. Propaganda is insidious, dishonest, underhand, misleading, end quote. And it's important to note at this point that Bernays' work was largely in the area of propaganda. He had worked for a medical review publication that took positions such as promoting the health benefits of taking showers and the harmful effects of wearing corsets. He dabbled in the world of being a press agent for theater productions and set up a vaudeville pancake breakfast to help Calvin Coolidge become more likable for his 1924 presidential campaign. In 1927, he was working with a small tobacco manufacturer to help them compete against the popular Lucky Strike brand of cigarettes owned by the American Tobacco Company. The American Tobacco Company took note and hired Bernays to come work for them instead. Their number one goal at the time was to increase smoking among populations that hadn't really taken it up, and the largest demographic that was largely untapped was American women. In order to come up with a plan for marketing cigarettes to women, he worked with Abraham Brill, who was a psychoanalyst. Together, they developed the Torches of Freedom idea. The idea that cigarettes represented freedom for women whose desires were being oppressed. He outlined the plan to recruit women to march for this cause, approaching local churches and finding several women at each church to march and to protest for torches of freedom. He was very specific about the kind of woman he wanted, too. He didn't want models or actresses or anyone look like they were trying to sell something. He wanted what he considered to be normal-looking, everyday women. Women who already supported women's freedom causes would be best, and he started spreading the message. Bernays himself hid behind these women. Even in communicating and organizing with them, he always used other people as go-betweens. He knew that for the operation to succeed, the public must believe that it was truly a grassroots movement. So Easter parades all over the country in 1929 had small delegations of convinced women marching for his cause. He had his people arrange publicity photos and press releases to accompany these marches, and the result was that hundreds of newspapers around America ran stories about how these industrious young women were marching for their rights to smoke cigarettes just like men. So the movement was what's known as an astroturf movement, meant to look like real grassroots effort but sponsored by some secret back channel. In this case, it was the American Tobacco Company. And this really opened a door for Lucky Strike to start advertising heavily toward women. They used ideas like promoting cigarettes as a form of weight loss. Instead of snacking, they would say, why not smoke a cigarette after dinner? And they promoted being skinny as a beauty standard and sold the idea that cigarettes were a way to achieve that beauty. Ads geared toward women would make cigarettes seem milder and easier to smoke, much like the cigarette ad you heard earlier. And almost instantly, Cigarette use by women shot up by 400%. The money paid to their propagandist was paying off. Year by year, more and more women began smoking, all the way up until smoking peaked in 1977. As we know, the late 1990s and early 2000s saw more and more research that reached the public explaining the dangers of smoking, and thankfully we're finally seeing a healthier population as a result. The numbers of throat and lung cancer and heart disease due to cigarettes have dropped rapidly and continue to drop by as much as 5% every year. So while the Torches of Freedom campaign never really gave anyone real freedom, not in the truest sense of the word freedom, it was an example of women fighting against unfair laws about what they can and can't do with their bodies. So in that way, maybe there are some parallels to modern day. But the whole Torches of Freedom thing it was a money grab 
It was a way for cigarette manufacturers to further expand their market by using women as pawns. So whether you smoke or you know someone who does, next time you see someone on their smoke break, now you have an interesting piece of trivia to bring up. The internet says it's true. It's time for the part of the podcast where I call a friend, and today I'm calling comedian Lisa Barry. Lisa is a comedian, performer, and sketch writer whose sketches have appeared on BuzzFeed, Hoo Ha Ha, and Funny or Die. She's also one of the founding producers of Seabus Comedy, and this is new. She's the host of a new podcast called Stay Pumped. It's a Vanderpump Rules watch party, uh, and if you uh, even if you you hate watching Vanderpump Rules like my wife is currently, uh, <laughs> you will totally enjoy this. Uh, what's up, Lisa? Good to see you. Good to see you too. I'm glad I'm, to be back on the podcast. I'm happy to uh, have you back. You're always great on the podcast. That's why I keep asking. <laughs> but I I need to know about this Vanderpump Rules okay. podcast <laughs> because it is a horrible <laughs> piece of um, entertainment that we're allowing yeah. our society to consume. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's horrible, but also it's kind of amazing. Um, I do say in the first episode of the podcast, so I I actually, I've seen all of the episodes. Um, I'm going back and I'm rewatching it, but I am making my brother David watch it for the first time and talk to me about it. He is not a reality TV show person. He is not, he's never seen any of this before. So this is all very new to him. And I say in the first episode, um, they all, and they've done interviews about this. They thought that they were basically the cast of Friends. And I think really they're the cast of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia because they are all they're horrible, all horrible people. people. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Uh, and they aren't like, what are they? They just work together, right? These aren't like, this isn't the Kardashians where they're like rich people who have right. notoriety. It's just like, we just found these people working at a place yeah. and we're going to make okay, them famous. Okay, so here's, a, here's sort of the origin story of Vanderpump Rules. And, and again, I was going to say, because you're, you're speaking recommend. to someone who's never seen the show. But I yes. know how awful it is through other people telling me that. Yes. Including and my in wife, fact, who's I think uh, it. you said even if you're hate watching it, this is good. I think it's best if you're hate watching it because okay. you don't really hold back on what we think about anybody. I mean, okay. they're all pretty terrible people. Okay. Um, or even if, you know, even if you're not watching it at all and you just want to live through the podcast, that's also, I, you know, I think that could be fun too. Okay. Um, but there is a whole series of reality shows on Bravo called The Real Housewives. Yes. And they are in different cities. I don't know if you've heard of The Real Housewives. Yes. So there was one particular housewife of Beverly Hills, Lisa Vanderpump, who owned a couple of restaurants. Oh. And she had a group of people at her restaurant, which were, they were a group of friends and they were very messy. They were just like a messy, dramatic group of friends. And she said this would make an amazing reality show. And she was correct. That... Because you quickly find out that none of them have any uh inhibitions they don't have any shame where are they <laughs> what, what part of the country are they in uh la and is that have do you think that has a bearing on what made them the way they are i think it, it does have part of it uh you know they all wanted to be they all say in the first episode that they wanted to be actors and models and singers i really think they all just wanted to be famous so okay. they very quickly in real life give up their dreams of being these other things because they figure out they can just be famous by being on this reality show That's and funny. then i think over the last 10 years they've been kept in a state of arrested development because they're just getting paid to still be those same people they were 10 I, years and, ago yeah. and i think that was what happened really with like the jersey shore and a lot of yes. these like um reality show people where it's like hey being this character worked for me because I'm rich now. I that's who yes. I am. And then they the, the arrested development is like the best way. Both <laughs> it's a it's funny, <laughs> you know, maybe we should have said that instead of always sunny. Um oh yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> probably a more apt also, comparison. But also, you know, horrible people. Um yeah. and and uh yeah, I have no interest in in watching it, but Ali is just like she'll she she'll claim that she's not like into it but she's <laughs> she's always watching it and um because and she's like just trying to catch up so that she can talk to her friend about it who also oh, okay. who told her about it so that's kind of the the motivation yeah. for her to start it and um i keep telling she's like it's just so funny because they're so awful i'm like then why didn't you watch tiger king with me because that's why i enjoyed tiger king because every episode i was like oh, no way you know and it, it was during the pandemic when we needed that and right. um 
Anywho, well, that's really interesting, and uh, I'm definitely gonna gonna let Allison know about that because uh, she'll she loves uh, you know we we listen to a lot of the, like the watch party style um, podcasts uh-huh. like Office Ladies and things. So, okay, um, yeah, it's 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 been really interesting seeing it through my brother's eyes, who's not a reality person, but also sure. just in general now in 2023 going back and watching things from 2013 i don't know if your wife had the same experience but that's been one of the wildest parts is going back and seeing what was sort of acceptable in uh 2013 no she hasn't really talked about that that much but i like you know I, every time i go back and watch uh like the wire um or or um the sopranos is another one where the beginning of the show the the difference between the beginning of the show and the end of the show just in terms of technology was insane. Oh yeah. You know, these these all these shows started in 4:3 ratio and ended in 16:9. They started with no phones and then flip phones and then, you know, iPhones. <laughs> it's crazy what's happened in 10 years. Yes. Um, you know. This is I feel like uh with Vanderpump rules, you can really see what was just acceptable in terms of the way awful people talked back in 2013 <laughs> and what was okay to Has it sort of do. And even I think a little bit the way we treated women in 2013, oh, you can okay. really see it represented in uh, the first season of Vanderpump Rules. Interesting. Well, you know, uh, I always talk about this. I, I still go back and watch old TV a lot and some of it really holds up and some of it does not. And uh, for instance, Seinfeld, for whatever reason, holds up. There's yes, very yeah. little in Seinfeld that wouldn't play today but cheers yeah. like i went back and rewatched a lot of cheers episodes and hey. there's so much misogyny um and, i mean but that's kind of who the the sam character like the, the main character of the show kind of was like he was and that was the joke that he was a misogynist and but it just i, I don't think you could put that person as a main character on tv now you couldn't you couldn't have an archie bunker even though that yeah. was the point you know the point was this person's awful in this way and we're going to highlight it you couldn't do it because it's almost celebrating yes. their awfulness right i think that almost you if you tried to do it today it's like the wrong audience would like it or like the wrong men great right? because <laughs> there was true. two what was that charlie sheen show yeah two and a half two men. and a half men yeah where he was almost like a sam malone character but he mm. was portrayed more positively I that's feel like. a good analogy and i wonder if even that show would do well if it started now um started today that's a good point it's because again it's, i guess that goes back to what i was just saying even in 10 years a lot has changed about what we consider acceptable yeah, but it's still on tv i mean you know there's the the con the c- content is still there you know it's not i always talk about how i still watch the cosby show the reruns even wow. though you know cosby is an awful human but the show stands up like the show there's there's nothing in that show that is really cancelable or whatever you would say. Like it's a uh, great outside show. of the real world. Yeah, it's a great show with great lessons and stuff in it. So it's just kind of yeah, you that's know, true. being run by a monster. Uh, all right, yeah. well, let's get into our, our podcast here. <laughs> yeah. Now, for this first question, as we always do, we're playing for a joke. So if you get it wrong, you got to tell me a joke. If you get it right, I'll tell you a joke. Here it is. The 1929 Torches of Freedom Women's March was a protest for what cause? Was it A, they were fighting against child labor, B, fighting against women being forced to stay home, or C, fighting for the right for women to smoke cigarettes? Read the question one more time. Uh, This was a march in 1929 called Torches of Freedom, and it was a women's march protesting what cause? It was either child labor, against child labor, not for child labor. (laughs) It was either fighting against child labor, against women being forced to stay home, or for the right for women to smoke cigarettes. So, I mean, it feels too obvious to say the right for women to smoke cigarettes, but I'm still going to go with it. I'm going to say the right for women to smoke cigarettes. The answer is C, the right for women to smoke cigarettes. Yes. (laughs) We've come a long way, baby. We have. We have. Uh, You know, in researching this, it's been pretty interesting to look through time and see like multiple pushes for and against smoking throughout history. And so, wait, women couldn't smoke cigarettes before that? Believe it or not. Um, So, cigarette smoking by women was considered a social taboo associated with loose morals um, in America. Now, 
it was that way in other European countries, but there were some European countries where it was sort of it just like Spanish women, Italian women, they just smoked. Um, Russian women smoke. Um, yeah. Europe, it took a while. So by the late okay. 19th century, you would see women sort of taking agency and smoking along with the men. But in America, there was a huge difference between the number of men that smoked and the number of women that smoked. And you just didn't see women smoking. And it got to the point where there were entire cities that had smoking bans specifically for women. So you could be arrested as a woman if you smoked in public in like the 1920s or even before that. 1908 was the New York City smoking ban on women. Uh, Men could smoke outside, but not women. So, um, yeah. And it was just because it was so such a social taboo. Um, You just did not see it. And it was it was associated with prostitution and all this type of stuff. So that's um, so interesting. It's so, so wild to think about women fighting for the right to yeah. give themselves and blood cancer. <laughs> the, yeah. The, and this was before. I mean, it wasn't until the, the 60s that anti-smoking stuff started coming about in America. And and one of the interesting things about this was that it was an astroturf movement. It was not grassroots. It was a, a cigarette company who hired a propagandist to start the Torches of Freedom campaign. Oh, OK. That makes sense. Yeah. So this, this, <laughs> they got not, this guy right. to not to say that women can't have ideas of their own back then or anything, but they got this sure. guy to really <laughs> rally them up and say, like, they're telling you that you can't do this thing. And that's not right. And it got them to say, right. yeah, that's not right. I should be able to do what I want, you know. Right. Uh, so, yeah. 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 But it's even, yeah, that feels like organically that's not what we would have tried to fight for the right to do. <laughs> Life's pretty good if that's the type of thing you're fighting for, you know. Um, right. Yeah. This was, yeah. it's safe to say in the 1920s, this was all white women, um, by the way, because um, this was a, a thing of privilege. If you're fighting for leisure type activities, you know, um, these were women who didn't have to fight for actual freedom. They were fighting for right. yeah. the freedom to smoke. Um, you know, meanwhile, we had Jim Crow going on in the South and everything else still. Uh, OK, yeah. so I owe you a joke and um, I'm going to see, first of all, in this joke, if there's a glossary, because there might be a sex. This is an old joke book. And Encyc- okay. this is the Friars Club Encyclopedia of Jokes. And there is very likely a section on cigarettes. But I'm going to I'm going I'm to okay. see this first. Um, OK, so there's oh, these are people. This isn't topics. Um, is it oh drugs we could maybe do drugs but maybe yeah, we'll do tangentially related <laughs> there's got to be smoking probably <laughs> or cigarettes circumcision we're not going to do that one although i am curious what kind of jokes um <laughs> i'm going to switch to instead of looking for cigarettes i'm going to look for the s because there's got to be here we go smoking all yes. right we'll do if this one sucks we'll do in the next one uh, the FCC came along and said, no more cigarette commercials on television. I'd much rather watch a pretty girl offer me a cigarette than an old lady ask if I'm constipated. Oh, boy. Okay. <sighs> because that was so bad and it has an attribution, the jerk who wrote that is Mark Russell. Um, and Mark is probably no longer with us. Um, just <laughs> yeah, based on well, the age of this book. <laughs> uh, there was also one by London Lee, which is apparently a comedian. It said, anybody okay. got a cigarette? Thanks very much, sir. I left mine in the machine. See, because they're cheap. Uh, okay, that's a um, little that's a little quippy. I can't, that one's okay. This is one that I've heard hack comedians do. The only thing that bothers me is if I'm in a restaurant and eating, and someone says, "Hey, mind if I smoke?" I always say, "No, mind if I fart." I feel like I've heard multiple <laughs> bad, yeah. like blue collar <laughs> comedy guys say that. I also it occurred to me. I don't know if you're listeners skew younger at all but you might need to explain about that middle joke there used to be cigarette machines that that does not exist anymore that's true if you were yeah i mean really if you're (laughs) under the age of like 40 probably yeah right under the age like 35 or 40 let me know if you are like in your 30s and you have seen a cigarette machine working, I'm really curious and it's not like a hipster bar like where that's like the oh right like the, the novelty of it um yeah, like the the whole cigarette machine was a machine in and of itself that didn't exist for any other purpose. It was specifically for cigarettes. Yeah. And you'd pull the lever <laughs> and the cigarette would come out and uh, 
Gosh. Because I feel like I can't even fathom that that ever existed now. I know. I know. <laughs> and before that, there were girls with trays that would just walk that around. Would walk yeah. around. <laughs> but uh, I don't know any of the people that saw that. They're all no longer with us either. Uh, right, yeah, I only know that from like TV shows. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I know the 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 trope. Uh, yeah. So speaking of comedy and jokes and stuff, what is the what's the current state of comedy in Columbus of stand up? What's what's happening? uh in terms of what is it like goods? i mean it's it's still it's happening it's it's doing well there's a lot of um i mean there's a lot of shows happening there's uh you know we obviously have the funny bone which everybody is is the familiar funny bone with is like but i don't know club. if people know there is a new newish club called the attic i don't have you i don't know if you've seen that i haven't seen um, i've heard of it yeah so they're doing a lot of shows there a lot of shows run by local or you know columbus kind of grown comedians mm -hmm. um so you know again the funny bone is great but it's you know not necessarily in individual shows being run by yeah you know by people by comics from columbus the attic is so it's it's a different feel they're both they're both great in their own thing um but i think the attic's been really really cool you know obviously covid kind of disassembled the existing scene and there were a lot of shows that existed that all you know, either the show shut down or in some cases, sadly, the venue itself shut down. Um, and I do think that the last couple of years have been, you know, really sort of refinding what the scene is going to be like, um, you know, finding new venues, finding new shows. I think that a lot of comics, you know, stopped doing comedy completely during COVID. You know, they either got busy or, you know, maybe they were close to calling it quits anyway. And this was sort of the push they needed. Or mm -hmm. I know a lot of comics personally that sort of took the opportunity spending time with their family to say, maybe I want to spend more time with my family, you know, just for various reasons. Right. A lot of comics kind of dropped out of the scene. We had some new comics come in. So it's really, it's a really cool time, I think, in Columbus comedy. I think there are a lot of really cool shows happening. We, um, you know, another really cool sh show that's happening is we've got now a Don't Tell Comedy, um, which is, it's a national thing, but we didn't have it in Columbus until the last couple of years. Um, that's run by Simon Frazier. Um, and that's a really, that's a really cool show. Of course, I have my show that I do once a month at the station in uh, Old Hilliard, which you've been on. That's mm -hmm. a really cool show. And that's that's new. That's post post COVID. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of really cool things happening. That's great. Yeah. That's great. And for our listeners, you know, who very just a portion of them are from this area. Um, you know, the the world is sort of blowing up right now with Matt Reif. And everyone's uh, talking oh, yeah. about Matt Reif. <laughs> He's from a tiny town that my dad grew up in, actually, and uh, he cut his teeth in the Columbus comedy scene, right? Sort of. So he left the Columbus comedy scene pretty young, mm -hmm. um, and he went out to L.A. pretty pretty young. So he didn't necessarily come up through the Columbus comedy scene in the way that a lot of people did. Okay. Um, but I do remember I did. Uh, so the Funny Bone has a contest. Uh, like a, you know, funniest person in Columbus contest. Right. And I actually remember him being in that contest when he was under 18 and his parents had to bring him and accompany him backstage because oh, it's a 18 and over venue. So he couldn't be there by himself. He was like 14, 15, 16 doing these contests. Wow. And he, and he was really funny back then. I, I remember being kind hear. of blown away that he was so young and already had such a good, um, you know, sort of a good ear for comedy and sort of had good comedic instincts even yeah. back then. It gives you respect when you know, like people have, even though they're young, have put time in and been interested in it for a long time and, and have had support, you know, in the community and yeah. stuff from it. And, um, you know, I know like on Facebook, I started seeing all these posts defending him. Um, and, yeah. but I wasn't seeing the posts attacking <laughs> him. So it was really interesting. It was like there, he, oh, okay. he must've been getting a lot of hate from comedians or something um i wasn't seeing it i'm sort of outside of like the stand-up community but i do belong to a few of the facebook groups yeah so i think that there was some backlash in comedian groups and and i you know obviously i am i live in columbus and i'm primarily in the columbus scene but i you know i've traveled and i know comedians from all over and i'm uh, in groups, you know, for other cities and other states. So I, I will say that this backlash about Matt Reif was not just in Columbus. It wasn't specifically because he's from here. There were a lot of 
there were some comedians. I don't want to yeah. say a lot. I want to say there was a certain segment of comedians who are maybe not, I want to say this in a very gentle way, who are not necessarily famous, mm -hmm. who I think maybe were a little bit upset yeah. that this person that didn't really work their way through their home scene sure. sort of left I, and, and went to LA and in a kind of non-traditional way became famous in this particular way. And then you started to see other comics defending him saying, you know, let's support each other. The scene doesn't need us to be tearing each other down because of, you know, because you didn't do it in this specific way or, you know, yeah. because you didn't pay your dues in this specific way. And for, I see two different things. I see in terms, I, I see the attack based on, um, and I, like I said, I'm not seeing these attacks personally, but I can see them happening. Um, and number one, he's a very attractive young guy with muscles. Yeah. And yes, yeah. <laughs> most comedians are like all of the opposite of all of those words. And yeah. um, yes. and the the other thing is he all of the videos that go viral are crowd work. And for yeah. someone who is a comedian and working hard to write and all you see are these videos of of completely just crowd work, um, you know, of him making jokes with people in the in the audience. It seems like, oh, well, this guy's being famous. It seems like he's being famous the same way that we talk about these Vanderpump people just for being in right. the situation in a reality type. But no, he actually does write and has jokes and everything. It's just that crowd work does so well on social media because well, it's always different and you're not burning your material that way. And exactly. um, that's exactly you know. it. You know, I think a lot of the comedians that I know personally, I mean, a comedian I know we've talked about. Uh, Mary Santora. So also, oh, yeah. if anybody is looking for a new comedian to listen to, and you yeah. don't listen to Mary Santora, oh, she's great. She's great. Um, but that's a big thing that she does is she pretty exclusively posts uh, crowd work. And she, I've seen her many times. I've I've worked with her. She obviously, I mean, she's got albums out. She's sure. She got has jokes. her written <laughs> yeah. material, but she doesn't want to burn through it. She, you know, you right. you want to hear it on the album, or she want, you know, you want to go to a show and see it. So what she's posting is crowd work because that's sort of a one and done. It's a funny moment that happened in the moment that's not going to be repeated. Yeah. So that's what you post on social media. So it's, yeah, it's and really it's similar social. with Matt Wright. It's, that's what you want to post. Sure, sure. Well, let's keep going with the quiz. We've yeah. gotten off on a tangent here. Um, yes. <laughs> ho hopefully our listeners enjoy this type of thing. Question two, you're, you're one for one, by the way. Question two, for this next question, we're going to play for one solid hour of housework. Um, and so as soon as we get done... Whatever Play. the thing is that you need to do around the house, uh, for me, it would probably be cleaning up the uh, the master bathroom or possibly, I don't know, you know, I got a friend coming, staying with us here in a couple of weeks. I got to clean up for that. Anywho, one solid hour on the clock. Okay. Um, here we go. In the year 2000, thousands of people protested in the streets of Lima while repeatedly laundering, literally laundering, like washing the Peruvian okay. flag. So they're washing the Peruvian flag while marching in the streets. Which one of these things were they protesting? Was it A, the very unpopular president and his dirty government, B, mm. Chinese imports, or C, Peruvian taxes on soap? I mean, it, it, Peruvian taxes on soap seems really on the nose because you're sort of getting all of it right Right in the display. Um, and that what country was this in? This is oh, in, in the in city Peru. of Lima. Oh. Yeah, in the city of okay. Lima, but they were it was the the I think the entire country saw saw um, okay. you know protests. Um protests. so Peruvian taxes on soap, Chinese imports, or the, the unpopular president, president and his dirty government. Okay, so I feel like the last one it just feels too on the nose. So okay. maybe I'm gonna regret this, but I think I'm gonna go with a, the president and his dirty politics. The answer, they were uh, absolutely, they were, they were, they, they, it was the president. They were, um, okay. sorry. <laughs> they, <laughs> I mean, it would have been so creative if it was the soap thing. Yeah, those were just things I came up with, I made up. Uh, so their okay, president, this it. guy um, of Japanese descent, Alberto Fujimori, was often called a dictator. He was accused of corruption and crushing opposition through violence. So for months, they gathered on Lima's main square and repeatedly laundered the Peruvian flag, which was a symbolic gesture that showed the system needed a thorough cleaning. And it worked because he wasn't reelected. 
And even more so than that, he was eventually thrown in prison for various crimes from corruption to murder. And he's still in prison today, I believe. Alberto Fujimori. So, yeah, you're killing it. You're two for two. And now I have to do an hour of housework, which my wife will appreciate because, uh, you know, that bathroom upstairs is a mess. I need needs work. Oh, man. Between this and the podcast, I'm giving her all kinds of gifts today. Gosh, I know. I know. And I have so much other work to do. I have have to... (laughs) I have a gig tomorrow in New York I have to pack for. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I haven't even, I have to charge all of the batteries for the show and I haven't oh, done any yeah. of this, you know. So that's important, yeah. <laughs> it is, but it's a college gig and I I always say like, because it's a college gig and I do so many of those gigs, I don't, I don't get nervous for gigs that aren't different. Like I had this cruise ship gig and it had been years since I'd been on a ship and I was so nervous in the packing and the getting ready and the putting together the set list just because it's not something I do all the time anymore. And uh, I was, I kept saying like, tell me I have a college show tomorrow and I don't even, I don't even think about it. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. It's like, once I figure out what I'm wearing and charge all the batteries, there's a lot of batteries to charge for the show for whatever reason. And uh, (laughs) once I get all that done, I'm, I'm solid. I think I have a, like a a 5am flight or something. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, (laughs) I've been doing it for 20 years. It's just kind of, I just know that even though that 5 a.m. flight sucks, it's better than the way I would feel if I was rushing to the gig. Um, That's worse for me. So I like to get there. What time is the gig? So the five. I got to load in at five. five. The gig's at seven. So my sound check is at six. I load in at five. Sound check at six. Show's at seven. So I'll have, uh, I'll have time to, hopefully I'll just go to the hotel and crash for a bit. I don't know. Um, I, I, there's this roadside America app that I talk about a lot on here. Um, and sometimes when I get to a city and I have time, I go on there and I look for stuff, weird stuff to see. It's like weird, kitschy roadside stops that are listed on this app. And I went on there today just to see what was in, I'll be in Cobleskill, New York, just to see what was in that area. And I had everything checked off already. So apparently I've been to this college before. (laughs) And you didn't Uh, remember? (laughs) No, didn't remember. Um, it's, uh. It's called uh, the Secret Cave or Secret Caverns or something like that that I went to there. And all the stuff on there is for signs for that. They've just it's a really eclectic place. And the guy gave me a tour. He was super cool. I was the only person on the tour and he was drunk while I, I could smell the vodka. On oh, breath. I mean, that sounds amazing. That fun. sounds like a great tour. It was <laughs> a lot of fun. All right, let's move on. For this next question, we're playing for a sticker, as we always do for the third question. It's orange and it's square. In 2012, Dorothy Peel was reported in the news as crediting drinking and smoking with what? A, getting her through army boot camp, B, building America as an industrial empire, or C, helping her reach the age of 110 years old? I am almost positive it's reaching the age of 110 years old. You are correct. It is reaching the age of 110. Here's the funny part. She said she lived to 110 because she quit smoking. When she was 104, <laughs> so, <laughs> she uh, and she drank a glass of sherry and a glass of whiskey every day. Uh, she had That's sherry at yeah. lunch and whiskey in the evening and smoked until she was 104, lived to be 110. I did find out she died the next year at the age of 111. And I'm guessing that was from all the whiskey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it finally caught up with. Yeah, her. <laughs> yeah. You know, you drink whiskey every day. It's going to it's going to get you. You smoked till well, you know, and maybe it was that she finally she did that interview and finally revealed her secret and lost the power of the secret. <laughs> it was the it was the power of the secret that kept her alive. Yeah. In that case, magicians <laughs> will live forever. Um, I have right, so yeah. many secrets. <laughs> oh man, you're killing it today. You're three for three. Question four. We're gonna play for an embarrassing story. So if you get it wrong, you gotta tell us about something embarrassing that's happened to you. If you get it right, I'll tell you one that happened to me. Uh, We both live in Columbus, Ohio, and when we were growing up, you'd have smoking sections in restaurants and bars that were pretty much always filled with smoke. You know, this was the era of buying cigarettes in a machine. In what (laughs) year did Ohio's statewide indoor smoking ban take place? Was it A, 2006, B, 1999, or C, 2010? It's definitely not 1999. Okay. Uh. Because I remember there were still smoking. There for sure were still smoking sections in 1999, 2006. I, what was 2006 or 2010? 2010 or 2006? 
I feel like in 2006, that might've been the city one. I don't feel like it was the state one. Cause I feel like, so my, I could have this wrong. My husband, I mean, then boyfriend, he is from like Steubenville area. And right. I'm pretty sure they still had smoking sections in 2006 in the Steubenville area. I think it's 2010. The answer is 2006 is 20. Okay. Yeah, you were, you were doing so well. Uh, so yeah, it was December 7th, 2006. It was passed by Ohio voters on November 7th, 2006. Chapter 3794 of the Ohio Revised Code went into effect. It banned smoking statewide in all enclosed workplaces in Ohio, including bars and restaurants. And do you remember what bars were doing? Like, I remember, is it Zeno's on, on third? It was Zeno's, yep. Because yep. I, I feel like I know exactly I remember, yeah, right they now. had like jars or like like fish bowls on the, on the bar that people would just throw money into. And then they let everyone the smoke. <laughs> yeah. And they would just use that yeah. money for the fines. And honestly, um, I mean, you know, not, not saying this is a good thing, but I feel like there were so many people that at the time when the ban first went into effect that were upset about the ban, that they probably made enough extra money by people choosing to go to those bars. They could probably pay the fine. Yeah, <laughs> probably there, you know, and it was the big story. Everyone knew about, you know, the bars yeah. that where you could still smoke. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember everyone being super mad about it. And I used to, you know, I used to in the early 2000s, late 90s was doing restaurant magic, you know, going from table to table. Yeah. Awful job. Really hard gig. You know, people just want to eat. And yeah. uh, they I can remember working those smoking sections and didn't think twice about it. Like it did not yeah. bother me. And now it would be so foreign for that to happen. Yes. To me. Like that would be so weird to be doing yes. magic for someone who's literally just smoking. Um, the idea of it seems so strange to me. Seems gross. And I feel like, you know, I had a lot of friends that smoked. Uh, well, and I, you know, I, and I smoked. Time. Yeah, I smoked for a while just because at yeah. the time I was dating a girl that smoked and it made me smoke for a while. Yeah, well, and I feel like so I, I knew a lot of people that were upset about the band. But then like a year later, even if they still smoked, they were like, oh, I'm so glad that there's not smoke everywhere. Yeah, right. I feel like. Pretty quickly, people kind of got on board with the smoking ban. That's band. funny. Well, uh, you went uh, three for four, and now to go for this one's for all the marbles. So if you get it right, you're welcome back on the podcast anytime. And if you get it wrong, you're banned for life. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is one I asked last week. I really liked this question last week, so we're going to ask it again this week. If you could travel back to the past, what would be the first dish that you ate? So this could be, you know, maybe a dish that's not available anymore or not available to you or something from your past. Um, this has nothing to do with this episode. Like I said, I just liked it last week. And last week we were talking about food. So what what would you go back in time and eat? I could go back in time. Uh, so I feel like. Hmm. Cause I'm trying to think of something that I couldn't get by also just traveling. Cause I feel like what I would want is like very authentic, like pasta from Italy, but maybe I could still get that if I traveled to Italy, but I feel like that's maybe what I would want is that like counts, I think. fresh, authentic, like pasta in Italy. And that's, that's an experience that you've already had that you would do again. You're saying. No, I haven't. Oh. So maybe I should just travel to Italy. Oh, I see. I thought you were saying like, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to let you have that one. That answer. The judges are, are telling me the judges are they telling me that and. that doesn't count because so okay. I thought you were saying like maybe there was a memory from your past of eating Italy, mm, eating okay. pasta in Italy. Not like the far distant past. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, OK. Well, in that case, it would be my uh, great grandmother. My great grandmother's Mexican and it would be her oh. her rice. She made rice that nobody in our family can really replicate. Oh, I love that. What was it about yeah, it the has, rice? Huh? What was it about the rice that made it so Well, there was good? it was there was tomato like a tomato sauce aspect to it okay. and uh there was just like it, so I've had dishes even at Mexican restaurants that are similar that it's like but none of it tastes the way that she made it. And honestly, she probably made it with like cheap ingredients and we're all trying to be too fancy. That's probably why we can't <laughs> replicate it. My my cousin, I have a cousin that's gotten pretty close uh, yeah. to replicating it, but none of it tastes quite the way that uh, she made it. So, you know, and I mean, possibly maybe some of that's nostalgia or memory, but I would go back oh, and I would have her rice again. Absolutely. My great grandmother's rice. Well, that's that's a winning answer. And I think um, if I keep asking this question, which I may because I really like this question, I think yeah, it no, says a, a lot. Question. Um, I think most of the answers you'll find are nostalgic. I, I think for me, it's definitely nostalgia because 
my answer is always going to be McDonald's pizza. And I don't think that if you had a taste test of different types of pizza, I don't think McDonald's pizza would win any awards. That said, uh, I don't I don't know if you remember McDonald's pizza. It was so different than anything else in the world. So I don't think I ever had it. I've actually heard other people talk about you are not the first person I've heard right? uh, sort of wax poetic about McDonald's pizza. So it, it looms large in a lot of people's yeah. memories, but I don't it's, remember ever it's having nostalgia, it. It's nostalgia, but it's also the juxtaposition of eating pizza at McDonald's. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's not a place where you would expect pizza. You know, like Subway had pizza for a while, too, and it's probably the same. There's probably pe- people out there that are that are, you know, nostalgic for that. And it's. It was just a different, the crust was very different than anything you can get. The closest I've found is the pizza at Schlotzky's Deli, which is hard to find those anymore. I found, I was in Texas and had Schlotzky's Deli recently. Um, Their pizza is very similar to McDonald's pizza. But um, I guess, you know, basically what I'm doing with this question is giving myself the, the, the space in the, in the earth to speak into existence that McDonald's pizza needs to come back. And I'll just yeah, I feel like you could start week. a movement yeah. and get McDonald's. I mean, it's, you know, I feel like it's happened before. Didn't, wasn't it like a grassroots movement that brought back the McRib? Yeah, <laughs> but I also like I right? tried one of those movements to get Katy Perry to follow me on Twitter and that failed. So um, <laughs> it, I don't know. I don't trust my ability to get these grassroots movements off there. <laughs> Maybe I need the cigarette company to hire a, a you know, a um, propagandist to. Right. Yeah. Because he was pretty get effective a bunch of women to, of to have a march for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Uh, you went four for five, which is outstanding. And uh, tell everyone where they can find stuff about your podcast and uh, CBUS Comedy. Uh, so for CBUS Comedy, you can follow CBUS Comedy on Instagram and find out when all of our shows are. Our next show is going to be uh, the last Thursday in July, which I believe is July 27th. Our headliner is going to be Ryan Singer from L.A. He is an amazing comic. Uh, so see bus comedy on Instagram for all of that. And then for the podcast, you can actually follow. So stay pumped was taken on Instagram, but I could get stay Vander pumped. So you can follow stay Vander pumped on Instagram, okay. um, or you can find us on Apple podcast, Spotify, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. It's called stay pumped of Vander pump rules. Watch party. Stay pumped of Vander pump rules. Watch party. I guarantee uh, that's going to be popular in this household. So but, yes. uh, <laughs> thanks again for coming on Lisa. It's great to talk to you. Yes. Yeah, great talking to you. Well, that's all for this week. Thank you so much to Lisa Berry for being my guest. Here's the voice of a young Brit who never had to fight for his right to smoke cigarettes. Thank you for listening to The Internet Says It's True. To listen to episodes ad-free and a week early, support us on Patreon. You can do that at patreon.com forward slash Michael Kent. If you learned something just now that you didn't already know, go to the Apple Podcast app and leave us a review with five stars and a few words. That helps us a ton, because that's how the algorithm works. I don't know what an algorithm is, but just do it! See you next week for a brand new episode of The Internet Says It's True! The Internet Says It's True would like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions help to make this show possible. Sean Brown, Joshua Endress, Dallas Ray, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Jim and Joanne Martin, Mitch and Andrew Joseph Kemplin, and the show's official Emperor, Kick Track. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge, and all audio clips in this episode are used for education and commentary and used under Fair Use Title 17 USC Section 107. You can listen to past episodes by searching for The Internet Says It's True wherever you get your podcasts, and you can see bonus content at patreon.com slash Michael Kent.